So, uh, as Patricia said, I work in Bonham Hospital and Trinity College and I specialise in neuropsychology of Huntington's disease. So, uh, to give you a background myself, I did an undergraduate in psychology and science and as Patricia said, I then went to UCL where I met the, the wonderful Ed Wild, who a lot of you know about. Um, and he first introduced me to, to Huntington's and since then I've had uh, an academic interest um, and I've been working towards my PhD, which I was lucky enough to be offered in Trinity College and Bowman Hospital a couple of years ago with uh, Niall Pender and Professor Orla Hardman, who was also mentioned today. Um, and I also work with patients with motor neuron disease and their family members uh, as part of my PhD. And, and a lot of my, uh, the work that Professor Orla Hardman has done over the years, I actually think I forgot to plug in my mic, did I? Let's go through. Oh, excellent. So a lot of the work that Professor Orla Hardiman has done over the years is because uh, or she's been able to raise great clinical services for modern neuron disease because of the, the backing of a lot of the research that, that her, she and uh, her team, our team, have done over the years um, and I'm a very new member of that team. Um, and so uh, my interest, as I said, in working with Professor Nob Pender is the neuropsychology of Huntington. So I want to first define what neuropsychology is. And it's basically uh, the study of the relationships between our brain, the brain processes, and how that impacts our cognition, our cognitive and behavioural. Uh, and that's changes in cognition and behavioural happen as a result of damage or disease in the brain. And this interferes with our function, our ability to interact with our world um, and process information, for example. Check it one more time, sorry, yeah. it's gone then. Apologies. That's alright. Probably did forget to put it in. You guys can still hear me, but the camera can't. I don't know if that's a bad thing necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> we okay now? Appreciate it. Yeah. And so, yeah, as I was saying, so what we're pr primarily interested in, in uh, as neuropsychologists, uh, and I'm a research neuropsychologist, not a clinical neuropsychologist, is uh, to study how these changes can affect thinking and behaviour and to help and support people when, when these changes happen. Uh, but before I go into the depths of what neuropsychology is and how it uh, is important in Huntington's disease, I want to tell you a little bit about the brain. Um, so this brain that we all have. It's a very complex organ, according to the brain. Um, but it is an enigma. Uh, it's not fully understood how the brain works, um, despite scientists trying for years and years. And a lot of what we've learned about the brain is as a result of injury that's happened. Uh, so people who've had very specific injuries and then studied by neuropsychologists and other scientists to see what happens to these people, how it changes their behaviour. And we're more generally, as neuropsychologists, interested in how these changes play out, like I said, in illnesses like Huntington's disease and how we can, uh, how we can support people when they have these changes. But because the brain is very complex, because it's a bit of an enigma, uh, there's a lot of commonly held beliefs that some of them are true, some of them are not. And the British Neuroscience Association did uh, a lovely piece uh, a couple of years ago for Brain Awareness Week. And just so I can see where we are at in the room, I want to test your knowledge and see what you know about the brain. They did a lovely piece on fact or fiction. Uh, was this true or false about uh, different facts around the brain, so commonly held beliefs. So the first one was, we only use 10% of our brain. How many people think that's true and how many people? Hands up for true? False? Okay, quite, a, quite an even split there. Um, you guys who said false are actually correct. We don't use 10% of our brain. We use all of our brain, 100%. And I know there's movies like Limitless and Lucy that might lend us to believe that we can unlock this hidden potential. But that, unfortunately, is science fiction. Um, we use uh, every part of our brain. And uh, for example, if there's even a small injury to the brain, it can cause any one of these uh, cognitive disorders, indeed just the cognitive uh, impacts of a tiny uh, a brain injury. And not, not every brain injury causes a disorder, but it's just to emphasise that if we only use 10% for our brain, then 90% of, of brain injuries would be, would be harmless, which unfortunately they're not. Um, so we, we use all of our brain and it all works together. Next we have is the, we have two hemispheres in our brain. Some people think that uh, our right brain is for logic and analytical and our left brain is the more creative uh, side. What do, what do you think about that? Is that true or false? Do we have a split in our brain? Who thinks it's true? Okay, we have two people thinking, three people think it's true. Everyone else thinks it's false? You would be right, yes. So I kind of alluded to earlier, our brain is a, a highway of communication. And even though there are functions that are lateralized, like language, for example, 
both of our uh, hemispheres, both sides of our brain are involved in lots of different processes. So both are involved in creativity and logic. And the last one then I'll touch on today is uh, that our, brains develop, our, our brain development finishes at puberty. What do we think? Is that true? No. Okay, unanimous on that one. Well done. I think I've, uh, <laughs> I've got to led you to this one now. And the 10 euro mitts in the bottom might, uh, might speak to that. But maybe a lot of you just have 20 year olds in your life who you're full sure that they're definitely not fully developed cognitively. <laughs> Uh, and you'd be right, because uh, our brains develop into our 20s, um, and that's the frontal parts of our brain that kind of, they stop us doing stupid things, basically. Uh, this uh, problem solving, this uh, inhibition, uh, the, this is our frontal lobes, and they develop well into our lives. But the brain is a complex organ, and there's 85 billion nerve cells, or neurons they're called, and they communicate via electricity. So when we talk about brain waves, that's actually what's happening in the brain. We have these action potentials that communicate. Uh, the neurons communicate to the different regions. And though it's only a very small proportion of our body weight, about 2%, 20% of our body's energy goes to our brain. So there's a lot goes on up here, even though sometimes it mightn't seem that way. Um, and our brains are basically like big fatty tissue, and that's because they're insulated. That helps the signals transmit quicker than in our lower order animals, for example. And it's folded, that's where you see all these lovely crinkles on the brain there. Again, to increase complexity, so we have more surface area, so we can process more information. And the cortex, that's the outside, the foldy bit of our brain. There's four lobes, and they have specialized functions, but they all communicate. And underneath that, we have the subcortical structures here, you can see. And these are, uh, these are older and more in terms of evolution, and they're involved in more automatic and autonomic functions. And it's known as our lizard brain and our mammalian brain. That's just to speak of how old they are. And so, like I was saying, we have specialized functions. So, for example, the, at the back of our brain here, this cortex is called the occipital lobe, and that's involved in vision. And I was talking about the, our risky teenagers, their frontal lobes aren't fully developed. And in, the frontal lobes are involved in executive function, planning, inhibition, and also can be related to uh, emotions and problem solving. And then the lizard brain here, the brain stem, that's involved in breathing, temperature regulation, digestion. And if we move up here, at the very center of the brain, we have the subcortical structures that are uh, the highway for our brain, that our cortex and other regions flow through. And they connect to our, our cortex to help us move, to help us process sensory information, feel pleasure and experience emotions. And again, just to go back to, to this diagram, there's very particular regions of our brain are involved in very particular processes. But really, we like to think of the brain as a, a network, like this highway. And we have this lovely, lovely colorful picture here of what's called white matter tracks, where neurons are connected and uh, communicate from, through different regions of the brain through these electrical impulses. And so these action potentials flow along these axons to be, help us interact with the world, process the information, and, and get on with our day to day. And so I've mentioned cognition a lot. I'm not sure if you're aware of what cognition is, but it's basically our ability to think. It's mental action that helps us process and understand the world around us. And as a psychologist or a neuropsychologist, we talk about different aspects of cognition, which can be intelligence, memory, language, or executive functions. And these are parts that I'm going to go into now and talk about why they're related in Huntington's disease, because we are talking about the brain, cognition, and behavior, as you well know, because that's what's impacted in Huntington's disease, as well as the motor, uh, motor features. So, I'm speaking, preaching to the choir here. You guys are, are the experts in this domain, um, more so than I am in, in most cases. But just to give you a quick background before we get into it, obviously Huntington's causes motor movements and that's what's needed for a clinical diagnosis. It's the, often what people see. What people don't see are these cognitive and behavior changes that can happen as part of the disease. And this is, all of this happens because of the, the faulty Huntington gene. Uh, and that's dominant and fully penetrant, meaning that if you have a certain number of these CAG repeats, has everyone heard of CAG before, CAG? This is the faulty part of the DNA that in the Huntington's gene, if there's more than 40, it means you will get Huntington's disease. That's the, the fully penetrant side of it. And, and that piece of gene makes this uh, faulty protein, the, the mutant Huntington. And uh, the age of onset in Huntington's is about 40 years old, but that can range widely. Um, but it is related to that CAG repeat. 
And at the moment, like I said, the diagnosis of Huntington's is predominantly, it's exclusively, I should say, got to do with the motor symptoms. Um, and that doesn't fully reflect the clinical picture, as I'm sure many of you are aware, where cognitive and behaviour change can come before that. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But this faulty protein, it causes, uh, it builds up in cells, in a particular region in the brain called the striatum. And it causes these cells to, to die. And when these cells die, that's when you get the symptoms. And the striatum here, you can see, is, is part of the, the basal ganglia in those subcortical structures. And the main ones are the caudate and the putamen. They're not important, but I just thought I'd let you know. Um, and the caudate and putamen form this striatum, and they are involved in the frontostriatal network. So the systems that connect the middle of our brain to our frontal lobes. And that's predominantly what can cause the cognitive and behaviour change that you see in Huntington's disease. And so when these movement centres break down, you have the interference in these networks. That means they don't work properly. And this gives us the, the triad, motor, cognitive and behaviour symptoms. And like I said, you can sometimes see these symptoms before any uh, motor symptoms start, where people uh, can have difficulty with cognition and behaviour. But these develop gradually over time, and it's not the same for everyone. Even though we have, there's one gene that causes Huntington's, there's quite a lot of variability in uh, how people present, what we call phenotypes, what the symptoms are that people get. And so as a neuropsychology researcher, what I'm interested in is predominantly the behavior and cognitive side of things. So that's what I'm gonna to speak to you today about. So the cognitive features of Huntington's disease, we have, you can see difficulties with executive function, with planning. Sometimes people aren't able to process information as quickly. There's difficulties paying attention, concentrating, and sometimes with memory and also social cognition. And I'll explain those a little bit more, but what we can think uh, of uh, as the, the caudate, the, that piece in the middle of your brain. If we think of the caudate as a secretary, in Huntington's, when the caudate, when the striatum stops working, the secretary isn't as able to process information as quickly as before, isn't able to organize, uh, you can see here, the, the sheets as well as she used to be able to. This causes the, the cognitive change that you see. And Anyone recognize this person? Yeah, this is maybe the most intelligent man that ever lived. And IQ or intelligence is basically the overarching uh, ability of a person to uh, acquire knowledge, use that knowledge for reasoning, to understand the world. And that can be verbal, nonverbal. Um, but as I was saying earlier, when research neuropsychology, we break this down further, where we can look at the particular functions that cause or are related to our IQ, like the executive functions. So the executive functions sit mostly in the front of our brains here, in the frontal lobe. And they're like the CEO. They coordinate all of our cognitive thought process. And there's lots of different executive functions. You can see like impulse control. So stopping those, the lizard brain uh, coming through and uh, aggression showing, for example. Or being flexible, our working memory to process and juggle information in our mind. And these are predominantly what are affected in, in Huntington's disease because of the, the network dysfunction that we see. Another thing that can be, people commonly note, and what people often uh, cite first as an issue for people is memory difficulties. Now, in, in Huntington's disease, we don't see pure memory issues. It's more related to encoding and retrieval of information. And what that means is encoding is basically putting our information into memory. So if we think of a, a filing cabinet, it's opening the drawer and putting the memory in. Storage is how good the the actual file cabinet is. Will it hold the information or will it fall out the back? In Alzheimer's disease, for example, the drawer is leaky. It's letting files fall out all over the place. And retrieval then again is opening back up the drawer and taking back out the files and dealing with them in our, this central executive. This is our working memory. And what happens in Huntington's disease is the file, the, the cabinet is working well, but the wheels are squeaky, they're sticky, and it's difficult to open the drawer both to put information in and to take it back out again. And that's where people can experience issues with memory. Um, but in Huntington's disease, people tend to have good recognition. Uh, prompts can help. And often you'll still have familiarity to things that you've already seen or heard. 
Another aspect of uh, cognition that can be affected in hunting is social, social cognition. This is basically how we recognize emotion in faces, in tones, in body language. And also, there's new research coming out looking at the expression of emotions in Huntington's disease. That sometimes people actually aren't able to express emotions or don't express emotions in a, a typical way or like they used to. And the last part and the really important part of social cognition is theory of mind, is being able to understand the intentions or the emotions of other people. And that can be, uh, that can be affected in Huntington's and can be a really difficult aspect of cognitive and behaviour change for people to, to appreciate. And the behaviour change associated with Huntington's disease, so this is the second kind of pillar that I'm going to talk about. You can sometimes see people where there's more aggression, there's a little bit more irritability. And that's basically if the caudate isn't doing the job that it's supposed to. If we think of it like a gate, it's opening too easily or for too long and letting the, the lizard brain emotions come out too quickly. And we see people aren't able to tolerate kind of the normal day-to-day -day situations that they would. But it, this can also happen, like I said, when people aren't able to infer what other people are thinking about. We also see a loss of self-care, so people start to, to notice less how they're looking, how they're dressing, cleaning. And this has, again, got to do with the, the striatum, the middle of their brain sometimes. They can appreciate. You can see that, okay, my hair is long, for example. But that then doesn't connect to our frontal lobes to say, okay, hair is long need to have a haircut. Or, I haven't changed my t-shirt in a few days, probably should have a shower. Those kind of things can break down and people aren't able to see this. And so the damage to these brain structures uh, can disrupt this function. And we see irritability and apathy, a loss of motivation. Um, but also, obviously a change in circumstances. Difficult life situations can make people irritable. I know I, I have days where I'm incredibly irritable um, and it's not got to do with Huntington's or changes in my brain, it's a particularly difficult day, it's rainy outside. So there's lots of reasons why we could experience behaviour change as well as psychiatric features, things like depression, low mood, things like anxiety. These are, uh, can be exacerbated by normal or sorry, by life experiences but in Huntington's disease changes in the brain cause these symptoms and can be exacerbated further by these difficult life situations. And psychiatric features like depression are common enough in the general population and they can be caused by life stresses, financial issues, in Huntington's caring for a family member or knowing that you're at genetic risk of Huntington's. These are all things that can impact you. But it also affects the brain regions and these are, are symptoms and features of Huntington's disease. And three in four people, unfortunately, will have some kind of psychiatric disorder, some kind of difficulty with their mental health or mood. The main one is apathy, loss of motivation. And people find it difficult to initiate or to, to carry on behaviours as they normally would. But also depression, with two and three people having Huntington's disease experience in some form of depression. And it's quite common in the general population as well, but it's much lower. It's one in 25 people in the general population. And these are all things that can and do happen in, in Huntington's disease as a result of changes in the brain. So I want to now tell you about neuropsychological assessment. I've given you the background to cognition and behaviour. <clears throat> and what we do you know, as part of the research and what we do clinically in Bournemouth Hospital is we use neuropsychological assessment to help people understand what's going on for them and find out how we can help and, and um, to see what, how they're getting on generally. And so these are some uh, cognitive failures. Um, do you read something and find you haven't been thinking about it and you have to read it again? Do you forget people's names? Do you lose your temper and regret it? Are you daydreaming right now? Are you listening? <laughs> are, these are all things that, these are all cognitive failures. So has anyone experienced any of these ever? Yeah, yeah I think everyone has and I, I had about five of these this morning, I think. Um, and this is the cognitive failures questionnaire, um, which assesses cognitive failures that can happen in people. And these are all normal. These happen in a healthy brain. Uh, and there's just blips, brain farts, if you will, um, that a normal brain are prone to. This becomes an issue when they're interfering with your daily function and they're at a high level that they might be distressing. And it's the same with behavioral symptoms. 
it, they, we all get irritable, we all have a little bit of aggression every now and then, but it's when it becomes, uh, impacts your life that we need, to, we need to have a closer look. And in neuropsychology, we use this normal curve. We compare people compared to the general population with the same age, gender, um, education, for example, to see where people fall. And also to compare people uh, relative to themselves in the past. So we sometimes do repeat testing. So that if we see changes in this, if we see this increasing, that's when we need to step in. And so the main part of neuropsychology is formulation, is understanding what's going on for a person, thinking about the life stresses, the disease, and how would these all come together to, to impact your, your life and your functioning. I want the assessment is a key part of this, where we'll do a clinical interview, we'll ask some questionnaires, so ask people about their experience day to day, how things are going at home, and also do cognitive tests. And these cognitive tests tack onto these different domains that I talked about earlier, intelligence, executive function, language, social cognition, and also the questionnaires that we have a patient and also someone who knows them well, because often those people see things that the patient themselves won't be able to. Um, and these cognitive assessments, has anyone here ever undergone a cognitive assessment? Anyone had cognitive tests before? Yeah. So there's a few people there, and they can range from 20 minutes, which is grand, to a mammoth three hours, uh, and that's a long, long time. But the reason they can take up to three hours is because depending on the question, depending on what's going on for in the function, uh, we, we, um, we want to find out exactly what's going on for you. And three hours is a comprehensive assessment where we'll probe all of the different areas of cognition. Um, I showed you some models earlier on, that memory model where we can see what particular functions are going wrong for a person and what particular strategies then might benefit. So I have a couple of these tests for you here, for those of you that haven't done them before. So for this one, I just want you to give me a word as quick as you possibly can that finishes the sentence. When you go to bed, turn off the? Excellent. He scraped the cold food from his? Brilliant. So that's not too difficult, okay? This next time now, I'm going to ask you to do the same, but I want you to give me a word that doesn't make any sense whatsoever in the context of the sentence. Totally unrelated. Okay? Give this a go. The whole town came to hear the mayor. Carrots. Yes, <laughs> Carrots. Straight in. No messing. Excellent. Most sharks attack very close to? What was that? Mountains. Mountains. Exactly. Yeah. So these are tasks of inhibition. So it's actually hard for our brains to, to not give the automatic response sometimes. And in people who have injury or damage to the frontal lobes or there's networks, it can be very hard to inhibit that response. Another one that we do is, uh, is this one. And this is a task of speed of processing. So how quickly you can uh, name these colors. So green, red, blue, green, blue. Red, blue, green, blue, red. Well done. And now what about this one? Give that one a go for me. That's not too difficult, is it? We'll step it up a notch. Now I want you to tell me what color the ink is. I don't want you to read the word. I want you to tell me what color the ink is. As quick as you can, off you go. Okay, so I'm hearing a lot of different, different words, different colors, and it, it's taking a little bit longer for our brains to process that. And that's true for everyone, but for people where they have issues with mental flexibility or, again, with inhibition, putting the brakes on, an automatic response, this can be quite difficult. And doing tests like this will help us give a sense of how a person's getting on in that domain. I also mentioned social cognition. Uh, so. I want you to look in this person's eyes and tell me which one of the words best describes how he's thinking or feeling. Excellent, fantastic. I actually have uh, prizes for these ones. Um, so this is the, the gentleman at the front here. Ooh. There you go. Congratulations. It's in roll HD hat. <clears throat> there isn't one for everyone in the audience. I only had a small bag coming up, so you have to do really hard on this next one here. What do you think about this one? How is she thinking or feeling? Decisive, I heard over there. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> now, Jared, 
<laughs> now, Jared, this is dangerous territory. And what about this one? How is this gentleman feeling? There's another one there. Well done. Not one for everyone in the audience, but you got one yourself anyway. <laughs> and what, this is the last one of these now. What do we think? Well done. Excellent. You got one there. So this is a task of social cognition. Thank you. It's how people are thinking or feeling. And people who have damage, again, to that, that, some of the structures in the subcortical region, underneath the cortex, find it very difficult to understand how these people are thinking or feeling. I think we're all better at it now because of the masks. We're more used to only seeing people's eyes. So that was just a, a, some quick tests that we might do as part of a neuropsychological battery. But this is very important in Huntington's disease for a few reasons. And as I mentioned, there's the cognitive behavior and psychiatric changes that sometimes aren't seen in Huntington's that are, can cause significant impact on people's functioning, on people's well-being, and also uh, on the quality of life of the, the care, the person who cares for them and their family. And the earliest changes that you can see in cognition and behavior can happen up to 15 years before any motor diagnosis. And so these are things that we need to learn about early. And we need to put supports in place to help people understand what's going on for them and the cares what's going on for you. Because these can impact work and relationships before, before any motor symptoms, before the clinical diagnosis has happened. So this is a real important reason for, for using neuropsychology in Huntington's. Also to learn more about the disease process, to understand more for science. What happens in Huntington's disease to better characterize the different phenotypes, the different profiles of symptoms that people have. And also for clinical trials. Obviously, everyone is really invested in clinical trials for Huntington's, and hopefully there will be treatments developed at some point. But we also need to understand how these treatments are impacting cognition, how they're affecting people's thinking and behavior over time to track changes as early as possible so we can try these drugs as early as possible. And also for symptom management. Um, a clinical understanding of the symptoms of Huntington's disease, are, we need to understand that better to help people understand the trajectory that they're on. Because unfortunately, at the moment, we've no cures. There's nothing we can do to stop Huntington's disease. And it's about managing these symptoms over time to be as healthy and well as possible for as long as possible. And also, as I said, to manage care, uh, to reduce care, strain, care, burden, and well-being. And I think Minister Rabbit mentioned earlier on, I think you guys are, are the caregivers in, in Huntington's disease are absolute pillars of the, the community and so, such a necessary part of the Huntington's uh, medical team of, for administration, for uh, uh, keeping track of appointments, for, for everything. You guys are, are kind of the linchpin. And the Family Matters uh, campaign was an excellent campaign that Patricia was involved in, HDAI, but also other Huntington's associations around uh, Europe to highlight the kind of how people's experiences with Huntington's disease. And I'd really encourage you to go have a look at the Living History Wall, which is a really nice account of people sharing their experiences in Huntington's. But there's also a survey with that. And a lot of these questions were asking about people's experience of Huntington's disease and how they were getting on in general. And pretty much everyone came back and was worried about everyone else. Patients worry about the carers, carers are worried about the patients, patients worry about their children. And that just shows uh, how much of a, a, an importance it is to look at caregivers in the Huntington's uh, population, again, in terms of neuropsychology. Because caregiver burden is a real issue, and this is basically stress experienced by someone who's caring for uh, a member of their family with uh, some form of disability. And research shows that in Huntington's, it significantly impacts not only the patient, but also the caregiver. And that uh, it's a complex caregiving structure where people in a family, sometimes because of the genetic uh, background of Huntington's, can be caring for multiple people. And despite this, there isn't a lot of research to help us understand what this looks like. And, but there was a, a recent paper that looked at caregiver burden and it showed that it was behavior and cognition that were mostly uh, connected to um, caregiver burden. Not so much the motor movements. So again, this is a really important aspect that neuropsychology needs to address. And my colleague Sheila, Sheila Kearney did her PhD in motor neuron disease and ALS, looking at the needs of informal caregivers and found that behavioral impairment, longer hours of unsupported care 
and different coping styles negatively impacted care's uh, quality of life, increased anxiety, increased depression, but also then found that certain coping styles actually reduce uh, caregiver burden and increase quality of life. And what's good is we can target these. We can improve caregiver situations if that we know this now. Um, and uh, Tom Burke, who you, a lot of you might know as well, who's done a lot of work in Huntington's as well as modern urine disease, uh, wrote uh, the, this paper on group interventions, a randomized control trial for different interventions for caregivers in ALS. And while there's a lot of overlap in Huntington's and ALS, and we can learn a lot from this, uh, there's, we still need to figure out, there's differences in Huntington's disease. We still need to see exactly what caregivers need in Huntington's disease. And that's what my group are trying to do as well. And I had the pleasure of being at the, the European Huntington's Disease Network plenary meeting last week in Bologna with uh, Patricia and Anne. And Charlotte Raven is a patient with Huntington's disease who wrote the book Patient One. She gave a keynote speech at the, the HDN and it was, it was brilliant, very moving. And her daughter stood up and she acknowledged, uh, Anna Sheehan was her name, the sacrifices had to be made, even though she was the child in the family. Um, she wasn't a priority. And this was difficult to hear, but what was really lovely in Anna's speech was that she said that Huntington's formed a unique bond between her and her mother. And this is something that we could call post-traumatic growth. Positive psychological outcomes to stressful, difficult situations. And that's something that our research is, is gonna focus on as well. And so I wanna talk about strategies and these are for everyone and I'm aware of the time. We have a little bit to go. Um, so these are strategies for everyone that can help people with Huntington's disease, caregivers, and some Joe Blogs who walks off the street. But in Huntington's disease, we have this, uh, in neurological illness in general, we have this vicious cycle where the physical effects, the, the actual disease causes impact on the, a person's emotion, which then impacts the cognitive function. And this vicious cycle can go round and round and people, if it's not in, intervened with, it can get worse and worse. And in Huntington's, there's already cognitive and behavioral change that can impact, uh, that this compounds. But what we wanna look at is this stress vulnerability model. That when people have high stress and are high, have high vulnerability, this can make them unwell. This, can affect how their, uh, their quality of life. But if we learn how to reduce people's stress, even with Huntington's disease or as a caregiver, and increase resilience or reduce vulnerability, people can stay well for longer. So that's what we're targeting with these strategies. And this is why we should consider the, the cognitive and emotional features of Huntington's, because they impact each other. And we want to break this vicious cycle. We want to reduce the stress and alleviate the, the burden of the illness and reduce the negative impacts to help people live well uh, for as long as possible. And this also reduces the caregiver burden and improves quality of life for the, the person with Huntington's and the, uh, the caregiver. And learning to self-manage isn't uh, about isolation. It's not about going it alone. It's about taking over the management of your illness and learning to break that vicious cycle. At the EHDN meeting, a test person uh, stood up and, and she is, uh, a gene carrier. She has pre-manifest Huntington's disease and she's starting to experience some changes. And she spoke about the cognitive change that she, she's experiencing. So I thought I'd, I'd relay that to you, her own experience. And she had, she had an inability to concentrate. It was difficulty for her to find words and she found it more difficult to plan and solve problems. But she also then gave some strategies that help. And I think rather than me tell you directly as someone who's no direct experience of this, Tess, found things that are very helpful for her and her cognitive and behavioral symptoms related to Huntington's disease. And these were yoga and mindfulness. And I'll talk about a little bit about mindfulness strategies later. CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, exercise and daily routines. These are all things that benefited her in these symptoms. And just to give you a quick fly through of the cognitive strategies, and I can give, uh, I have a sheet down the end there for people to sign if you want to, to me to email you these strategies, but just to give you a quick overview of some things we'd recommend for people to improve memory and organizing. We'd always encourage people to write things down. And if writing is more difficult, to use your phone, to record voice messages or text to speech, um, to use a whiteboard at home. You can record things that you need to remember, important events, the day of the week, whatever it is. Uh, and 
for like issues with motivation, with apathy, for initiation. Checklists help. Reminders for things that you know are important to you that you want to do every day. Like going for a walk, having a shower, ringing a friend. To write this down so it's in front of you. And to remove distractions and only do one thing at a time. Because the best of us, if we have a radio going on in the background, it's very difficult for us to pay attention. And for everyone else, for people with Huntington's, as I'm sure you're aware again, there can be difficulties processing information. So to slow things down, keep things simple. Break down information into chunks. Learn things one at a time. And make sure you understand information. Don't be afraid to ask questions. It's very difficult for anyone to remember information if we don't understand it. So don't be afraid to ask questions, to clarify. Also having a, a, like a central place where you keep all of your important things and saying things over and over. So if you need to remember an important point, re rehearsing that, either silently under your breath, like with a name when you meet someone new, like I was trying to meet some new people today and trying to remember their names. So for me, I was saying it under my breath, trying to remember and uh, rehearse this person's name. And even saying it out loud is an extra benefit uh, to remembering things. This is called a verbal memory trace. And I should say, I want to thank Noel Pender and Sarah Clark for a lot of these tips as well. And um, these are things that they use clinically in their practice in Beaumont. For apathy, people might need help initiating, ac uh, initiating actions and prompts or a, a schedule can help people do this. Or for irritability, say for if there's a thing, something in particular that irritates people, you use this ABC chart to plan out what the trigger is, what happens when that trigger uh, occurs, and what the consequences of that are. And if you address that trigger, you can make people feel better, be less irritable. And CBT, psychologytools.com, is a very good uh, resource for people if you want to uh, learn about CBT. And CBT is the, the therapy that, um, the framework is basically that our thoughts impact our actions, which impact our feelings. And these are all interrelated. And if we can manage or change how we think about something or change what we're doing, that can make us feel better, make our thoughts uh, be better as well. And these are all things that my mammy would have told me. She, and mammies are often right. In terms of cognition, in terms of, cognition, in terms of behavior, in general wellness, getting a good night's sleep, drinking lots of water, exercising, uh, spending less time on our phone, drinking less alcohol. These are all things that help everyone, yeah. but also really help in, in Huntington's for especially cognitive and behavior change. And little instead of uh, little, um, little and often instead of all of all at once is also a really good strategy. Break things down into more manageable chunks because fatigue can be a real issue. I'm sure again you're you're probably well aware of this, but fatigue can really impact mood, cognition, and behaviour. So be mindful of when you're tired and take rest. Also, I mentioned mindfulness, relaxation strategies, and the Beaumont uh, address here, the the mark is the Mindfulness and Relaxation Centre in Beaumont that has a lot of really good strategies in it that you can log on for free and use. Also, be kind to yourself. Getting angry or critical doesn't help. And often these things are quite difficult for people to, to process. So give yourself permission to, to be nice to yourself. Let yourself off the hook. And this is a lovely quote that I found um, just online that I think is a, a mantra for, for everyone and everything. Self-care isn't the self-indulgence, it's self-preservation. If we're not looking after ourselves, we're not, we're not good to anyone. That goes for people who are caregivers, patients, again, Joe blogs off the street. Even though it, it might feel like sometimes that looking after ourselves is a privilege, it's not. We need to look after ourselves so we can contribute, we can help other people. <clears throat> And I know I've gone way over time now, but I'm gonna fly through the last bit, which is about the research that we have going on at Beaumont. And this is the lovely team that we work with. And like I mentioned earlier on, Professor Orla Hardiman has built the foundations of the Modern Urine Disease National Service on research that we've done, and that, well, not that I've done, that they have done over time. And so I'm hoping that this team will be the foundation of clinical services for Huntington's in the future. We're providing that evidence base. And the first study that we have in Beaumont that I want to talk about that a lot of you will have heard about and you now all have lovely hats on uh, is the Enroll HD study. And this is a global multi-site observational study of HD patients and their families. 
and there's 21,000 people who are participating in Enrol at the moment in 155 uh, clinical sites in 23 countries. So it's a huge study. And Huntington's signs and symptoms can change slowly over time. And so these big observational studies, checking in with people over the course of long per uh, time periods, will help us see how things play out over the whole disease course. And the aim of Enrol is to understand all aspects of Huntington's, to inform clinical trials, best clinical practices for caring for patients and families affected with HD. And in Beaumont, it's been going since 2017. And we have about 83 patients uh, enrolled for 196 visits so far. And obviously, unfortunately, COVID has had huge impacts on our capacity to enrol in, in Hunting, or in enrol, I should say. So um, we're back up and running. And hopefully, if you're on that list, you will be hearing from us very soon. So by monitoring the disease, how it happens in people, how it changes over time in fine detail, uh, Researchers can use these huge data and biosample collection to learn more about Huntington's disease and hopefully effectively treat it and slow down the process. And so what's involved in this is an annual visit to us in Beaumont. Um, you meet our neurologist, Dr. Sarah Darcy or Sinead McGuire, and you do a neurological assessment, do a brief cognitive assessment, and you all know all about cognition now after that talk today. Um, and with, that's with our new research assistant, Kim. Um, Psychiatric and behavioural assessment happens with our psychologist, Dr. Uh, Niall Pender, Professor Niall Pender, I should say, and Dr. Annette Lloyd. And this is an interview about your, your life, your family history, and your background, how you're getting on currently as well. And visits also include a, a blood sample, a genetic test that uh, I'm currently the phlebotomist in that. So I wear a lot of hats, and uh, not the enrol hats though. Um, and our total visits can be 90 minutes to two hours. And if you want to find out more, again, there's uh, information there on the Enrol HD website. And any family member from a HD family can take part uh, over the age of 18, regardless of your genetic status. So if you want to find out more, if you want to ask me questions, feel very free and you can check out the website there as well. Uh, and HD Cognition is another one of our studies that runs alongside Enrol. And while Enrol is massively comprehensive, it covers all aspects of Huntington's disease, we're particularly interested in the cognitive and behavioural aspects of Huntington's and so we're delving further into that to better understand the thinking and behaviour changes that happen in HD and how they influence cognitive behaviour change over time. To try and understand this as early as possible and to characterise the phenotypes to understand how people might progress with the symptoms. Track these changes over time, better understand uh, the needs of HD patients and caregivers and make the case for more uh, psychological approaches to understanding onset, to understanding um, Huntington's. And this is all to advocate for better services. So again, anyone who's over the age of 18 can take part in that, any HD family member. And we're also looking for controls as well. And I have some flyers in the back for anyone who wants to take home uh, some information about that. Uh, and what's involved is we do a, a neuropsychological assessment. And this is for about two and a half hours with me at the moment. Uh, and we also do some online questionnaires. And you've seen some of the tests that we do on that today, so we'd be pros, we no, uh, no bother to you to get through them. And this is me, big smiley head me, at, uh, in Bologna at the EHDN meeting. And I presented some of the findings, just preliminary results from the HD cognition study. And that was looking at apathy and how it's related to cognitive function. And we found that this is a really early indicator of behavior change in Huntington's is apathy. And it's something that impacts cognition as we go. Um, so it's a really important finding and I hope to, to develop on that. Um, we're also validating clinical screening tools to help use in the clinic. So we don't have to put everyone through these big long batteries. And the ECAS is one of those. This is a, a short form that looks at all the different domains that I mentioned today in cognition. And uh, this controls for motor function and it's validated in, in ALS, but we want to do that in Huntington's as well. Again, so we can check in with people early in the disease course to catch people to understand what's going on and put in supports if need be early. And the good thing about this, as I said, it controls for motor movements, which a lot of other screeners don't do. And it also has repeatable forms, meaning that we can test people over time and we can reliably detect change if there are any. And there's another big smiley head here. This is Mairead Fallon, uh, who unfortunately just left our team, but who was a brilliant asset to uh, HD Cog. And she's presenting her findings on the, the ECAS on this test. And it, we found that it was sensitive to change, cognitive change in manifest Huntington's. Uh, and there were some changes that were detected in the pre-manifest group. So people who had the gene, but who hadn't had any motor symptoms yet. 
And this preliminary analysis showed that this was on par with the, the gold standard long battery. And so that's really encouraging. And it's also encouraging that other groups are looking at the ECAS in Huntington's. Uh, this one paper in 2021 found in an Italian group, they looked at manifest Huntington's patients that it was also uh, useful. So this is really encouraging. And the last part I want to touch on is HD care, which again is, is uh, part of the HD cognition study and looking at the needs um, of caregivers in Huntington's disease in Ireland. And the reason we're doing this is to improve uh, the care of the patients by looking after what caregivers need and also to improve the health and well-being of caregivers, who I said are uh, invaluable in the Huntington's disease um, day to day. And some preliminary results from Ailish Conroy here, who, um, who put some of these together, show that about 65% of people feel burdened um, caring for a relative with Huntington's and feel strained around a relative. And I'm not saying this to make people feel bad. Or, um, th this is common in Huntington's and it doesn't have to be. Uh, the fact that we're learning about these things mean that we can advocate, like Minister Rabbit said, for services that need the evidence base. We need to have these uh, to show that this is something that people struggle with. But it's something that we can work on and something that we can address to benefit people. <clears throat> and the last study that we have is HDTMS. And this is a new study um, that my colleague Roisin McMacken is, is doing. And Roisin's done a lot of work in ALS, uh, as most of our, our research is being lent from. And this is using measuring the electrical signals, the brain function, uh, for better understanding of the disease and for developing therapies and look at how these changes in the electrical signals in the brain, changes in the, the network function, how this impacts and relates to symptoms. And this is for prediction. So we can see if we can detect or uh, predict with these tests, how someone might uh, progress with Huntington's. And then how does HD affect the connections between our brain for clinical trials? So like I said, with, with cognition, what we want to do is detect early changes in cognition. Roisin wants to do that in relating how the cognitive and motor networks work in our brain to, uh, again, to measure if therapy is working or not in clinical trials. And this is transcranial magnetic stimulation is what it is, um, TMS. And it's non-invasive. Uh, you sit in the chair and you relax and they use this big magnet to see how the networks in your brain um, communicate. And so there's lots of research going on in Huntington's globally in Europe and, and also in Bauman Hospital and Trinity College. And there's a lot still we don't know about in Huntington's and a lot we can improve on. There's clinical trials ongoing, as I'm sure you're all aware. Basic research looking at the disease processes and the genetic modifiers and biomarkers in Huntington's disease. Clinical research looking at movement and sleep and wearable devices monitoring people at home. So there's lots of lots of advances in lots of different domains. And that's also true of cognition and uh, psychology. And there's better guidelines now for interventions in, in Huntington's that came out recently. So the reason we're doing this research is to learn more about Huntington's, to improve science, but mostly to, to give back to, to you guys so that we can improve people's quality of life, the day to day and, and just general well-being. And so if you're interested in research and want to get in touch to, to take part in that, in any of these studies, you can email uh, here on hdresearch.bauman.ie. And again, I have flyers down the back of the room there if anyone wants to take them home. If you're not a, a techie, my phone number is on that as well. Um, but just to sum up, uh, Huntington's is a complex disorder uh, caused by this CAG repeat and causes that triad of cognitive, motor and behaviour symptoms. The cognitive symptoms and behaviour uh, symptoms are caused by this, are, are ca due to disruption of these networks in our brain that, from the different areas. And this neuropsychological assessment, that's our tool in the armory that we use, can help highlight um, these difficulties and then support patients, support people who are experiencing these changes. And we want to do this as early as possible, and that's what our research is, is pushing for. Um, and we want to help you guys self-manage, because there aren't the services that there should be for Huntington's at the moment. Self-management for caregivers, self-management for patients at home is key. And these strategies can help. And like I said, I can send these to you at the end. Um, and all of uh, the work that we do is aiming to better characterize these difficulties, to uh, use a better appropriate tools to measure, and again, understand the needs of patients and caregivers. 
for that evidence base that Minister Rabbit was talking about, to advocate to government and to funding bodies that people need more support that they're not getting at the moment. So just to thank uh, our research team, uh, there's a big long list of people here who have been involved in this. My supervisors, Noel Pender and Orla Hardiman. Uh, everyone else, all the research assistants on the, the project. Um, and Dr. Annette Lloyd, who some of you in the room know as well, is our new senior clinical psychologist working in Huntington's and modern urine disease, who is fantastic. Um, so she, she's uh, one of those people that can really help uh, deal with the emotional, cognitive, behavioral difficulties associated with Huntington's. And none of this research will, would be possible um, without funding from the HCAI uh, and a little bit from Monkstown Foundation and Research Modern Neuron, which allow me to do the work that I do and my colleagues to do the work that they do. So thank you very, very much for, to everyone there. Um, but a big thank you as well to, uh, to all of you. All of you have participated in our research for your collaboration in, in the work that we do and taking part because, like I said, we, we do this work for you to help you understand the, the symptoms, what's happening for you in terms of Huntington's disease. And we couldn't do it without you because that's what bring, will bring about these clinical services, will bring about the change and the, the better uh, measures and understanding of cognition, of behaviour in Huntington's disease. So thank you all very, very much. Um, and Patricia and Liz for having me here today. <laughs>